Good morning, everyone. And welcome to Zion Fairwater. Special salute to those who are joining us online today. We're glad you could come and join us in any way that you can. We begin our service today with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. Will you please stand as you are able? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment of silence and self-reflection. Most merciful God, We confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in great mercy has given the Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of God and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please remain standing for our opening hymn. And our opening hymn, um, we had a last minute change. Thank you very much, Wendy, for for that, because it was me. Um, Our opening hymn, follow the screen, lift high the cross.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and prayer let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the scriptures. Our first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an I for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth below or as that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing all children for their in the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who loved me and kept my commands. You shall not make wrongful use of my name, the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misses his, misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day, that is the Sabbath, to the Lord your God, you shall not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female servant or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discernment of the discerning. I will throb. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks desired wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Gentiles, whoops, sorry, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. <clears throat> the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and the oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign have you to show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the the temple of his body. When therefore Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I remember when I was a little kid, and we're talking grade school here, and all of us learned very quickly every year about discipline, about morality, 
about right from wrong. Now the rule in my grade school was that if you were naughty, you got your name written up on the blackboard for all the world to see. Everyone knew that you were a rule-breaking kid. And as if that wasn't shameful enough, if you messed up a second time, you got a big old check mark by your name. And that was really, really bad because that meant a letter was going home to your parents. And God only knew what would happen then. But the problem was, you often didn't know what behavior could get you into trouble and what wouldn't. And sometimes it felt like, and it looked like, that the kids that the teacher liked could get away with things that everybody else got their name written up on the board for doing. And sometimes it seemed like if the teacher was in a bad mood, more names would go up on the blackboard for the very same infraction that the teacher didn't seem to mind yesterday. And yet at other times still, it almost looked like if a parent was volunteering there in the room, or if another person of importance was in the room, Nobody got their name put up on the board. Now, we knew there were rules. We didn't know what they were or how they were going to be enforced. Did you ever have an experience like that when you were growing up? Whether at home or at school or at church, we all learn morality. That is, we all learn right from wrong as very young children. And once we could actually figure out what those rules were, everyone was happier. Everyone got along so much better. Everyone was safer. There was no one screaming or crying or fighting. Today we hear a very famous story out of our Old Testament. Moses receiving the Ten Commandments of God. These words are words of life that a loving God gave to his children who were like newborn babies wandering around in the desert freshly freed from generations of slavery. But now they no longer had, um, they were no longer slaves being told what to do. They were no longer under the rule of a pharaoh or a king who would punish them at whim and without reason. They needed to learn morality. They needed to learn right from wrong since there was no one ruling over them, telling them what to do every second of every day. Everything was different now. These Ten Commandments were the basics given right there at the beginning of their new life together. And God hoped that his message got across in these things. The message that they were God's chosen people and that they were freed from slavery now and that they have been given freedom and abundance and love and deep abiding joy in a loving and generous act of mercy. God gave these 10 steps for those Israelites to follow so that his beloved people wouldn't have to guess, so they wouldn't have to worry, so they didn't have to be afraid they would be punished at whim 
without reason or whenever the wind changed. It was also a way so these people could be safe and happy, that they might play well together and prosper in a new land. Ten simple rules to follow. But humans are humans. And over time, God's beloved people began to see the Ten Commandments as a list of rules. And if you had rules, you had to have loopholes, and they were going to go find those loopholes. People stopped looking at the Ten Commandments as they were intended, as a gracious gift that guided them and helped them and made things run smoothly. The people of God started seeing them as some authoritarian blackboard name writing system. But you see, you can't blame them. They had no coach or model or Sunday school teacher to remind them of how to live peacefully and lovingly together. And so God's people became like that one selfish, unruly, clever little schoolboy who knows exactly how far he can go and exactly how much he can split the hairs of interpretation so as to not get a check mark by his name. And so in our Old Testament, there are 613 laws all trying to explain how to live out the Ten Commandments. What do you do if you make a mistake with one of those ten? What do you do if your neighbor makes a mistake with one of those ten? What can you give your God? What can you sacrifice to make your God happy? How can you become better than everybody else? And that right there, in a nutshell, is a history of the people of God. And when God saw that his people were struggling to follow ten little rules, ten rules that he had provided to make life better and happier, God decided to do something about it. And so God sent prophet after prophet after prophet in order to call the people back into relationship, back to the life that God had created them for. But I don't have to tell you that prophet after prophet after prophet got ignored if they were lucky. Much times it was much worse. Now fast forward to the New Testament. Today we have a gospel reading about Jesus coming into the temple, and boy, is he angry. So why is Jesus so angry? Well, Jesus, rather than expanding the Ten Commandments into 613 laws, Jesus condensed it all into one. One law. Love one another. Hang on. It is very important. Because when we love one another, we are showing our... Loving one another is all God wants for his people. Living happily in community, much like how God created Adam and Eve to be with him in the garden. Unfortunately, so often back in that day, the religious authorities made it harder for people to worship. They made all these extra laws. And worse, they took what was meant to be an expression of love by God and twisted it into something to control people. They manipulated the poor. 
They tried to manipulate God. They forced out-of-towners to use foreign currencies and cheated them in that money exchange. They decided who was good enough to let in to worship and who was not. They sold animals to kill. They turned God's house into a strip mall for shopping. Jesus was angry. Jesus is angry because the intention of the law was lost. Love was lost, and the way to honor God was lost. So Jesus offered his body to be the final sacrifice. He told us that God didn't want to do this animal sacrifice any longer. And what we learned from Jesus is that God's message is just never going to get across until God's message gets across. Gets across. Because the presence of human sin which is the tendency to think that we can control where we ultimately fall on God's right and wrong calendar. The law, the commandments, the gestures of forgiveness, none of it is getting across. So in Jesus, God's message gets across. All of the things that stand in the way of a direct relationship with God, all of those systems of rules and guilt and shame, they die forever on the cross with Jesus. It's like the teacher taking a great big eraser and erasing your name off the chalkboard saying, I love you. The true message is the one written on the life of those who gather beneath the cross every week. The true design is lived in the compassion and mutual understanding that God works in them and through them. The true force of the cross is known when people live forgiven and free because they know that God has claimed them forever. It's the life that the Ten Commandments were intended to foster and flourish. The message that God has always been trying to get across to us. I love you. Now go and do likewise. Amen.
please stand as you are able as together we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made a man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again the living and the dead. The kingdom will have no end. In the evening, spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshipped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. You alone are God. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest. Awaken the church to the mystery of your presence and give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of your deliverance. Hear us, O God. You renew creation. Drive out those who would make the earth a marketplace. Protect rainforests, mountaintops, oceans, and wilderness areas from commercial exploitation. Unite nations, policymakers, and businesses in efforts to reduce carbon emissions. Hear us, O oh God. You judge the nations. We pray for an end to war and strife in every land, especially in the Ukraine and in Gaza. Strengthen international efforts to negotiate peace and provide humanitarian aid to people fleeing from conflict. Hear us, O oh God. You bring healing and hope. We give thanks for physicians, nurses, researchers, therapists, and public health workers who prevent and treat illness. We pray for any who are sick, especially those we now name either silently or aloud. Hear us, O oh God. You abide with your people. Sustain any in this community undergoing life transitions. Marriage, divorce, childbirth, adoption, moving, graduation, employment change, or a death in the family. We pray also for those who are preparing for baptism. Hear us, O oh God. You bring life from death. We remember our loved ones who have died confident that they have new life in you. May we trust that nothing can separate us from your love. Hear us, O God. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us turn to one another and share a sign of God's peace and love.
Then we will be serving dinner at 5.30, and then at 6.30, Pastor Clay will be here with Jen. And we'll be hearing Jen sing the worship. Um, following that, if you're on the worship and music committee, please know we're going to gather 7 o'clock right after worship. Um, we'll be gathering here. Regarding next week, if anybody gets to church next week, it will be a miracle. So remember, first of all, on Saturday, Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, tonight we have our, our next uh, youth, New Orleans youth group meeting for that whole team. So if you have somebody that's on that team, or if you'd like to be a part of that team, uh, it's kind of late in the game, but you can definitely hop on. Um, we are meeting at Grace Rippin this week at 6 o'clock. So um, send anybody that way. Uh, also, thank you for everybody who's been attending the, um, uh, the, the suppers before Lent. Uh, any of the money that's been donated will go to help um, get things for Lutheran World Relief when we do our service projects in confirmation class. Sometimes we run short of like say diapers or notebooks, things like that. We use that money to help uh, subsidize those um, relief efforts. Um, also, I want to say thank you to everyone who's been bidding on the auction. Today the auction will end at noon, so um, after by the time I get out of church over there at 11.30 and get the last bids in, at noon it'll shut. So then at that time, if you're online looking, uh, you can look and see if you won your items. And if uh, you're not an online person, I will call all the people that win with paper slips. I'll call you and say, hey, you won this or you won that. So um, if you don't hear from me in the next day or two, you didn't win. <laughs> so, but I thank you so much for all your help in this effort. Uh, the money is going to help offset some of our costs for our trip. Uh, so when we're down in New Orleans, you know, we can make that, make that time there to be in the word and dwelling with the people of that community. So I appreciate that. And I think, yeah, there's something else, but... Alzheimer's wins today, so, okay, thank you. Are there any other announcements that need to be shared? Very well, then, let us present our offerings to God. Please rise for the offertory.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. Him, himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, holy God, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you, and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The gifts of God for the people of God, you are welcome at this table. You may be seated and with the communion assistance, please come forward.
congregation, please stand as you are able for the blessing. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this, of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the... Go ahead, let's do the closing hymn. You can be seated. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.